international history at King's College London's War Studies Department, and I'm part of the leadership team at the Centre for Grand Strategy, which is one of the organising parties for this series of seminars, along with um, the University of Cambridge's Centre of Geopolitics and the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office's historians. And we're very excited to have three of the FCDO's distinguished historians with us today to kick off our series. They will say a little more about their work and I don't want to tread on their toes, but just as a way of introduction, I just wanted to say that the FCDO historians are responsible for providing a long-term policy relevant perspective on diplomatic and strategic issues. In essence, they are at the cutting edge of applied history and have been practicing it as an institution for decades. And so we're very privileged to have them with us today to discuss this work. Just to let you know that we'll be recording today's session and we're very excited to have you with us. If you want to, um, to, to pose a question to our panel or if you have any comments, please put it in the, um, in the Q&A at the bottom. But for the moment, I'll hand over to Sir Patrick Salmon who will be talking to us today. Thank you, Charlie. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to present our work to, to a wider audience than, than usual and indeed to kick off this, this new series of applied history seminars. Um, the first thing I'll do is introduce my colleagues. Um, first of all, my former boss, Jill Bennett, former chief historian here at, at the FCO, as it then was, and Richard Smith, the deputy head of the historians team, and myself as, as chief historian. And what I'm gonna do tonight is, what we want to do is to explain how our team of in-house historians, and of course it's unusual for any government department to have such a team, in many ways I think we're quite unique, how we helped our department, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, which in September became the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, to respond to the series of crises and challenges that arose during 2020. And of course, it was an extraordinary year for everyone, but it proved a remarkable year for us too. It was a year in which we were busier than ever, more called upon than ever, in ways that we just could not have anticipated, I think, um, a year ago, almost a year ago today. What I'm going to do first is, is share my screen, um, and I want to just, uh, I'll do it in a minute, it takes a bit of time, and I'll now put it on to um, the slideshow. This also takes a bit of time. It should be there now, I hope. Uh, I've put this pie, pie chart up here simply to give you a range, uh, the, an idea of the range of the things that we've done in the past year, uh, graphically on the right-hand side, but, but in more detail in a, in a list on the left-hand side. We won't have time to talk about all those things tonight, but they're there as a sort of checklist. Um, and there may also be a reminder, I'll put it up again later. There may also be a reminder when we come to answer questions later on. Well, this is how we plan to divide things up tonight. First of all, I'll hand over to Richard, who will place our role in context, um, explain really how historians have provided policy advice to ministers over the last hundred years. I will then talk about the way in which we supported the FCO, FCDO during the COVID-19 pandemic, moving on to an issue that came up in the summer and remains very much unfinished business, but extremely important. And that is the, the department's response to the Black Lives Matter movement. Then finally, Jill will talk about the ways in which we provided historical perspectives on some of the policy challenges that arose during the year. They include things like Russian revisionism and again, very topically, the integrated review. So I'm gonna move on one more slide and I'm going to stop speaking and Richard will take over. Thank you. Thanks very much, Patrick. Uh, good evening, everybody. And um, as Patrick suggested, what I just wanted to do here was to take a little bit of time just to talk about, um, you know, how historians came to be in the Foreign Office, um, to take us back to really where it all began to put our present work in context. So, I mean, there've been historians in the Foreign Office uh, for over a hundred years now. And in fact, it was the latter stages of the First World War, which brought a group of academic historians who were originally based in the Admiralty into the Foreign Office in February 1918 to form a historical section. And their task was to prepare briefing for the peace conference 
that took place in Paris in 1919 and led to the Treaty of Versailles. Now, the historians in the historical section overlapped with another group of historical experts, the Political Intelligence Department, who came into the Foreign Office around the same time, headed up by um, James Hedlund Morley. Now, the historical section went on to produce 174 studies bound up in 26 peace books um, on subjects ranging from Zionism to the Easter Island, from Spitsburg to the Kiel Canal, anything basically that they thought might be raised at the conference um, at Versailles. And members of the historical section and PID subsequently attended the Versailles Peace Conference. And Hedlund Morley said that he, quote, fulfilled the secret desire of many international historians by attending and influencing proceedings. Now, another historian present was the 19th century diplomatic historian, Charles Webster, who was there uh, because of his knowledge of peacemaking after the Napoleonic Wars. And he wrote a peace handbook on the Congress of Vienna, which was later published in 1919 by OUP and became a classic history text. Now, Webster, of course, returned to the Foreign Office in 1942 in the Economic and Reconstruction Department, where he played a major role in post-war planning, not least the setting up of the United Nations. And, you know, in that task, he brought both his academic knowledge plus his practical experience of peacemaking at Versailles. So if the REF, for example, had existed uh, back then, uh, Webster would have been well-placed when writing his entry on impact. Now, the historical section and the PID were both closed down on grounds of economy in 1920, but James Hedlund Morley remained as historical advisor to the Foreign Office. And in 1922, he set out in a minute the duties of the historical advisor, beginning with a statement that, quote, it is obviously necessary for the successful handling of diplomatic negotiations that full and reliable information should be speedily available as to the previous history of each matter that comes up. In other words, his primary task was to provide historical context. And he dealt with these either in conversations, through short minutes or longer memoranda. He added value basically, when information was required from sources over and above what could, what could be found in the Foreign Office archive by the librarians, and when a more general knowledge of modern European history was needed. Now his other main task was to keep abreast of official literature relating to the origin and responsibility for the First World War. He was more and more convinced that the full story of British policy before the war must be published. And he would later edit um, the first uh, volume of the series, British Documents on the Origins of the War, published in 1926 on the July crisis of 1914. I should say that Hedler Morley is the character, uh, the man you can see on the top uh, right-hand side of the slide here. Uh, now, this series, Documents on the Origins of the War, um, was started in 1924 when a decision was taken by the Labour government under Ramsay MacDonald to publish a series of documents to counter the influence of the famous German series you can see here, Die Grosse Politik, whose aim had been to undermine the war guilt clause of the Treaty of Versailles. And this decision in 1924 really kick-started the document publishing program that still forms the core of uh, a core, core function of our work today. And you can see that um, the origins of the war series was followed by an interwar series um, covering 1919 to 1939. And then later on after in the 1970s, there was a decision taken uh, to start a third series, Documents on British Policy Overseas, which follows British foreign policy post 1945. And that's the series we work on today. Now the post of historical advisor lapsed uh, with Hedlund Morley's death in 1929, but was revised twice since. Um, in 1963, Foreign Secretary uh, Douglas Hume appointed Rowan Butler, a fellow of all souls and historian of 18th century France to the post. Now, since 1945, Butler had been an editor on the second document series, DBFP. And 1949 was also the year when the historical section was reformed in order to support the work of the external editors in their publishing work. Now, Butler's letter of appointment specified only two duties, preparation, of historical memoranda and narratives and the development of channels of communication between the foreign office and the historical profession. 
Now the post lapsed again on Butler's retirement in 1982 and was revived briefly for the last time when Roger Bullen was appointed historical advisor by Sir Geoffrey Howe in 1987. Only he died tragically young, yes, and less than a year later. So, uh, and the, uh, the figure at the bottom uh, on the right-hand side here is Rowan Butler. Now from 1990 onwards, the operation has been entirely in-house and today we have a chief historian rather than a chief historical advisor. FCDO historians are heirs to two distinct but connected traditions. One is inward looking and comprises a provision of historical information and advice to policymakers. And the second one looks outward and aims at contributing to a greater understanding of British foreign policy through the publication of diplomatic documents. And both these functions are closely related because they rely on historical training and expertise and each reinforces the other. And to these two original tasks have been supplemented a host of other tasks. And some of those you are going to hear about in more detail now from Patrick and Jill. So Patrick, over to you, thanks. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, well, I'm gonna talk about what happened at the beginning of last year and what happened at the beginning of last year was COVID-19. Um, the effect on us was very immediate and it was a drastic reduction in the size of our team. At the start of the pandemic, we were a team of six, four historians and two support staff. Richard and another colleague were redeployed for several months um, to duties engaged in with repatriating uh, British citizens from overseas, an enormous task. But that left really Jill and, and I as the only two specialist historians. And I can recall feeling quite disorientated at that time, wondering how I could do my bit, perhaps as someone might have done at the beginning of the First World War, you know, what did you do in the war, daddy, and all that. But I did remember that in another life, uh, a university lecturing life more than 20 years earlier, I delivered a series of lectures on epidemic and pandemic diseases. Uh, this was a course on world history that we were running at Newcastle University. I dug them out, um, updated them as much as I could, and converted them into a series of blogs that were published on the FCO intranet very early in the pandemic. On the strength of that, I was contacted by a member of the FCO's policy unit who was writing a paper on post-pandemic planning and wanted to know what sort of lessons might be drawn from previous pandemics. Uh, well, what I then did was simply search, um, I, actually mostly what I did was just search through JSTOR in the classic way I typed the word pandemic into the search engine and, and saw what came up. And it threw up a host of historical examples, some of which found their way into the policy unit paper. In one sense, that was quite a simple task, but at the time there was no one else who could have done it. And I think no one else with historical judgment to work out what the relevant lessons might be. Uh, the one that sticks in my mind that, and, and that found its way into the paper was that local solutions to pandemics were usually more effective than national ones. And I think a lot of countries might have found the same thing um, in the last year, over the last year. Um, and the examples I found were very geographically, very widely spread. Some of the most interesting ones came for instance from Ireland in 1918, the Spanish flu epidemic or the South Pacific. So having done that, I was still looking for something to do and rather arrogantly, I decided I would try to write an official history of the FCO's response to the pandemic, an idea I quickly dropped. But I did retain the idea that it might be worth trying to construct a simple timeline of the FCO's response. Um, this could serve as the basis for someone else's narrative or contribute to the FCO's response to a public inquiry when that eventually came. I played around with all sorts of models and I didn't really know where to look for information, but I dragged it from whatever place I could. Um, my breakthrough came when I actually came into contact with the FCO's COVID-19 task force and got hold of one vital source, uh, an email chain recording the foreign secretary's daily meetings on the pandemic. And I, again, quite simply and quite laboriously and quite boringly, but again, no one else could do it. I extracted the key decisions and put them in a word table. Um, it seemed simple, but in fact, it required endless judgments about what constituted a decision, uh, who actually made it, how it was communicated, how it was acted upon, and so on. And I kept doing that diligently for several months. 
up to the point at which the COVID-19 team had reached the point where they had enough resources and enough perspectives to start thinking about constructing their own record of events. And at that point, I simply handed over all my work and that was the last I saw of it, except I saw um, a, a number of very detailed Excel spreadsheets recording the whole exercise in which I could, you know, I could rather flatteringly see evidence of my own work. That kept me busy probably up to about June and around about June, thank goodness, uh, Richard came back to the team and then something else happened. And that of course was Black Lives Matter. It didn't come entirely out of the blue. As a team, we knew that issues of ethnicity and diversity were already important for many colleagues in the FCO. And in 2018, we had actually published a study of foreign office policy on race since 1945, uh, which attracted a good deal of attention, a good deal of praise actually from um, both within and outside the office. We also knew that the artworks in our main building in King Charles Street were controversial. Vice magazine had run a critical article following one of our open door days a couple of years ago. Uh, moreover, they were not only controversial, but extremely uncomfortable for many colleagues um, who were working in the, in the building on a daily basis. They simply did not like walking past some of these items. And then of course, the murder of George Floyd brought these issue, issues to the surface in the most dramatic way possible. It prompted a debate among staff which hasn't yet run its course and it's required a response from the Foreign Office as an institution uh, to, in which I think the historians have been called upon to play quite an important part. Our response has really taken two forms. Uh, one is to do with education, training, awareness, if you like, and that has mainly um, been a matter of modernizing and adding to course, a course on the imperial, Britain's imperial legacy that we constructed for the Diplomatic Academy a couple of years ago. Uh, that academy has been renamed the International Academy since the merger of the two departments. And we're greatly expanding that course. Um, we hope to be able to launch it probably in May. But um, Richard, who's taken most of the responsibility, I think would, would, would testify that it's an extremely difficult uh, thing to do. The, the language is extremely sensitive and it's very, very difficult to get right. And it's not just a matter of on the one hand, the empire did good things, on the other hand, the empire did bad things. It's far more complex than that. Um, so I'm not sure we've got it right, but we're doing our best. And I think there's a great deal of institutional support for that effort. The other question was what to do with the imperial legacy of the building itself. Um, you can see a corner of the building in the, in the left-hand picture here, a building constructed, completed in 1868, really at the height of Britain's uh, imperial experience. Not only the building, but of course the artworks that it contains. Um, this is one of the things it contains, a series of extraordinary murals on the grand staircase in the most um, ornate and uh, impressive part of the building. A series of murals depicting the rise and expansion of the Anglo-Saxon race, uh, completed by an artist called Sigismund Goetze uh, as late as 1921, even though the style looks about 50 years earlier. Uh, the uh, images of, the, of Britannia uh, and the Anglo-Saxons and so on are controversial enough, but most of all, I think, most offensive of all, is this image here on the uh, bottom right-hand corner of the central panel, which depicts Britannia as peacemaker at the end of the First World War. Um, and I feel sorry for Goethe in a way because he planned this thing before the, the war even broke out and he had to change it ra at rather short notice, but he had to add a lot, a lot of figures to the um, mural and actually remove one important figure and that was Germany. But Germany is now represented by a series of broken uh, armaments uh, on the ground in the front. But he also added the figure, he obviously felt he had to add the figure, a figure to represent Africa. And as he put it, and I quote, we have in front a little Swahili boy bearing tropical fruits, reminding us of our obligations and possibilities in the dark continent. Well, 
it was a well-meant image, I think, in 1921, but it's one that now many colleagues in the FCDO find at best patronizing and at worst offensive. We then move on to another part of the building and that's the former India office. Uh, this was uh, constructed uh, following the demise of the East India Company and the taking over of India under, under, directly under the British Crown. And in this very ornate and richly decorated part of the Foreign Office, we find works of art brought from headquarters of the old East India Company, like this painting on the left, uh, which uh, celebrates Britain's e economic exploitation, uh, not only of India actually, but also of China. Um, and you can see on the right, um, the way in which imperial imagery was built into the fabric of the building itself. There are many, many statues, uh, including this one, like the one, uh, one of Warren Hastings. And these images pose a dilemma. What should we do with them, basically? Should we perhaps cover them up? Uh, should they be removed? They, many of them do not form part of the fabric of the building after all. Many of them we don't even own. They may be owned by the government art collection or the British Library. Or should we perhaps leave them in place and explain their significance? And that's the route we've decided to take. And it's, a, it's one, of course, that we haven't decided to take. It's one that's a, a policy decision, I think. And um, that's, the latest, that's the challenge that really has faced Richard and me in particular since last summer. I have to say that COVID has tr transformed and, and greatly facilitated the way we do this. Uh, since last summer, Richard and I have delivered a large number of presentations online, um, either via Teams or via Zoom, uh, to many different groups within the uh, FCDO. Um, I usually focus on the Goetze murals. Richard usually talks about the India office. And I think um, we've become, over the last uh, less than a year, quite expert in our respective subjects. Our audiences have ranged from the tens, of, the tens to the hundreds these are audiences rather like the present one, actually, that we're, we're in now, which are far larger than we could ever have imagined in the old days. The old days, barely a year ago, when we were pleased if we got 50 in, into a room. Well, it's too early to know whether this will be enough to meet the concerns of staff. I hope it will be. Um, but uh, more, more generally, I think it points to again, the value that we add to the FCDO, the value of having people on the spot who know their audience, um, who can respond quickly using our existing expertise, or as we've done in the last year, acquire new knowledge quickly, and then we can adapt it to the, the requirements of a particular audience, large or small. That's the point at which I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Jill, thank you. I'm just doing the same as Patrick. Thank you very much, Patrick. I hope I hope you can now see my slides. Um, well, while all this was going on. Um, uh, to do with Black Lives Matter and the art, um, the artworks and so on. Um, I was in also extremely busy last year on a whole range of other historical issues. Um, I can't talk about them all, but I'm going to um, talk about some of them. And one area that I dealt with particularly is uh, that of revisionism and disinformation. Now, um, part of this is the question is, what is the relationship between them? And some people would argue that revisionism is by definition disinformation, but as a historian, I spent a lot of time saying that that's not necessarily the case. Revisionism may be a part of a wider disinformation campaign, but um, sometimes it is rooted in genuine concerns by a range of countries. Now, obviously Russia comes to mind, but it's by no means only Russia. And in 2020, the impetus for a lot of these campaigns was the fact that it was 75 years since the end of the Second World War. And of course, there were a lot of um, commemorative events planned. 
And from the point of view of Russia in particular, they had a pretty good idea that they were not going to be included in many of these commemorative events. And that only fed into an, an enduring sense of uh, insecurity and feeling that their, camp um, their contribution during the Second World War had not been properly recognized. Um, and so one big piece of work that, that I did was um, in the wake of a, an article published by Vladimir Putin, which was called The Real Lessons of the 75th Anniversary of the Second World War. And this article provoked a lot of media comment and a lot of criticism. But in fact, a detailed analysis of it shows that really there's a great deal um, of factual information you can quibble about interpretation, but actually that's not a productive way to look at this kind of material. It's more important from the point of view of foreign policy, of policymakers, to understand where it was coming from. And I identified in particular three themes on which uh, this material was based, insecurity, both political and economic, um, uh, suspicion of other people's uh, intentions, and a sense of betrayal, that is achievements ignored, promises broken, bewilderment that Russia, in the view of the, the Russian regime, is disrespected of a powerful state. Now, the point about all this is not whether their arguments are, are, are justified or not, but the fact that they exist at all. And for the benefit of departments within the office itself and indeed uh, in the embassy in Moscow, there, there was a historical analysis to be done here to talk about certain aspects that they didn't necessarily know. So for example, the fact that Russia has a very strong archival tradition. Indeed, archival work is regarded as almost a patriotic duty. And the 75th anniversary of the war was bound to intensify a lot of um, already existing feelings. In particular, the Putin article looked at the European Parliament Declaration in 2019, which if you read it from a Russian point of view, you could say is inflammatory because it really almost blames the war on the Nazi Soviet pact. And uh, as the Russians said, it doesn't even mention Munich. Now, of course, the Nazi Soviet pact and Munich are not the same thing, but in a sense, there is a historical link because while Russia is still always being sensitive of, about the fact that between the signature of the pact in August 1939 and the entry into the war um, after the German invasion in 1941, they were, if you like, on the wrong side. Britain actually remains uh, sensitive on the subject of Munich for rather different but related reasons. So my argument really was that Putin's version of history has to be seen in the wider context of contemporary international criticism of Russian policy in the Ukraine and elsewhere, and the failure of the West in Russian eyes at a time of global instability to take full account of Russia as a significant player. By retelling the story of the lead up to World War II, pointing out that mis mistakes were made on all sides, but that Russia eventually saved the day, Putin is drawing an analogy to the present so I did a lot, of work on, a lot of work on this, and it's not just Russia, I would say it's, it's China as well, for example, and um, in, in September 2020, for example, there was a joint Russian-Chinese narrative being put out on their respective roles in the Second World War and a desire to safeguard their interpretations of what had happened. Indeed, in April, Russia moved its official end of the war um, from the 2nd to 3rd September to make it the same day that China celebrated victory. So a lot of work went on, not just on Russia and Putin, but on revisionism and disinformation generally. Now, allied to this, and this is more drawing on my work as an intelligence historian, is the question of, well, what can you do about disinformation? And I've done quite a lot of speaking and writing about this question of using the tools of the intelligence trade for disinformation. One thing that I have often spoken about and written is that there's lots of people out there identifying disinformation. There's fewer people analyzing what its impact and the question of instance and impact 
is one that I think these tools of the trade can help with. So of course, there's absolutely nothing new about disinformation. I mean, you know, when I give a real talk about it, we go back to Plato, but it has always been a tool of statecraft, both offensive and defensive. But historical examples, plus an intelligence-based approach, can help identify disinformation and build in resilience against it. So that is my, but we're not doomed to lose the struggle against disinformation and history can help us win it. And I'm not going to go through all the things on this slide in your, I'm sure a lot of the people in this webinar will recognize some of these equations and some of these factors. Um, lots of people have written about that kind of thing. But I do think there is a very good basis for using history to counter disinformation. And last year I was called upon to do a lot of work in this area. And related to this, various works on intelligence of different sorts. So for example, well, I always uh, do blogs, both internal and external blogs, but a joint piece with the GCHQ historian, David Abertat, um, on the question of um, uh, co-breaking at Bletchley Park, because of course that again was part of the um, commemorations for the 75th anniversary. The relevance for the FCDO is that you know the work done by crypt analysts at Bletchley Park, and indeed not just at Bletchley Park, but as the uh, the new official history of GCHQ points out by by uh, Comsec Communication Security and the Y Service, other aspects of SIGINT uh, did make a huge contribution to success in the war, as well as binding veterans to the Code of Silence for Life. And today the work and the secrecy of GCHQ is also of vital importance to Britain's security. It's interesting that the rules drawn up by um, Winterbottom, Fred Winterbottom, in April 1945, justifying the secrecy included that you couldn't give the Germans any possible excuse to explain away defeats by the force of arms. They, we, they had to think it was because, they hadn't got to think it was because we were breaking their codes or intercepting their messages. Um, Winterbottom said, we may well need ultra for underground German activities after the war, and any hint, of course, during the Far Eastern War uh, of um, ultra would um, compromise the Pacific War. He said other enemies may arise in the future and were they to know what had been achieved by Ultra in this war, they would be on their guard lest the same thing before them. Of course, the irony of all that is that it was Winterbottom who actually broke the secret out in his book in the early 70s. So a certain amount of work on intelligence, uh, how it plays into foreign policy, how it plays um, this, the investing intelligence initiative which the historians have been involved with together with information policy department within the FCDO so far has been um, my part in it is really to be involved in interviews online interviews for an internal audience uh, for example with John Ferris about the GCHQ history um, with Sir David Omond about his book How Spies Think and more recently uh, the, um, with uh, Nigel Inkster about his book on China and cyber. So it's by having discussions online, bringing a historical perspective that um, it, it, this is uh, making intelligence matters more familiar to people within the office. And the final thing I want to mention is this Historypedia, which is a new initiative that we launched last year. We have been thinking about it for a while, but it was actually launched just before uh, lockdown last year. And this is really, um, I mean, you all know about Wikipedia. This is a version for within the FCDO. Um, of course, you can look up things on Google, you can look up things on Wikipedia, and it may be very good indeed, but it's not going to be specifically policy relevant to people within the FCDO. So the idea is to have a tool to help staff better understand historical events that still have relevance to their work today. So for example, I mean, the Nazi Soviet Pact is one of them, but also you see other examples, Lend-Lease, Death of General Sikorsky, things that come up again and again, the use of the UN veto, the storm in the Gulf of Temple, and they are short um, 
the equivalent of a page and a half, two pages, they have a paragraph on what is the FCDO relevance of whatever it happens to be, a brief factual summary of what it's all about, and suggestions for further reading. And you won't be surprised that we always point um, people in the direction of documents on British policy overseas when it contains um, further information about this. And finally, I just want to mention uh, that the uh, 75th anniversary of the Anglo-American Financial Agreement, which fell in December last year, we did a number of things uh, uh, to mark that. Of course, it was covered in one of our volumes in some detail, but we had an online event which included uh, people from the United States Diplomatic Network and the embassy in Washington and so on, of course, because of the, the, you know, the way we can have online webinars, they are all able to join in. So we had an event at which I and Professor George Peden, uh, Emeritus Professor of History at, um, at the University of Stirling, who's a specialist on all these areas, and also Michael Hopkins uh, from the University of Liverpool. And um, we talked about the agreement and its implications. And of course, in a situation where now um, there is likely to be an, a negotiation with the United States on trade coming up, there are a lot of very topical um, elements which come up during that. So these are just some of the historical things. I mean, everything we do is historical, but these were fairly tricky issues that came up and kept us all, as Patrick said, extremely busy um, during 2020. So I'm going to stop there because I think we're probably now ready to have questions. I'll, I'll just take over, Jill, and. Um... Thanks very much. Um, that's really all we had to say in detail, but what I, might, I just might just say a few words in conclusion, uh, really to reinforce some of the points we've all been making. I, I think what the last year has shown is that, if I may put it this way, the, the FCD was quite lucky to have a team of in-house historians um, because the team is instantly available, it knows its audience, and it knows where to find the answers to the questions that arise. Sometimes we know those answers ourselves, um, and if not, we usually know where to find them. And that's above all, I think, the benefit of having close links with the academic community. Um, Richard quoted the original brief for Rowan Butler as chief historical advisor back in the 1960s to maintain links with the academic community, and that's very much what we still do. Having said all that, sometimes we run out of information or we just ha haven't got it to hand quickly enough. And then we have to simply educate ourselves. And that is really what we've been doing, I think, all of us, one way or another, over the last year. All of us are a lot more knowledgeable than we were this time last year. And I think that has to be a good thing. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to uh, trying to answer your questions. That's great. Thank you, Patrick, Jill and Rich. It's really fascinating just to hear all the work that you've all been doing over the past year and um, yeah, just a great insight into the range of interests and the range of uh, expertise that you have in-house. I was just wondering, um, just as just sort of a kickoff question, um, one of the other things that's happened over the past year has been the, the change in name of the uh, uh, from the FCO to the FCDO and, and with bringing it in, in um, um, development and um, incorporating DFID. Has that changed your work in any way? Has there been, um, were there um, were there people in-house at DFID as well who were looking at some of these things and who are now working in your team? Or is there people who focus specifically on the development part of things? Um, I'll answer that if I may. That's a very good question. Um, and it's a question we asked when we joined with, with DFID. And the quick answer is no. Um, it's not surprising really. Um, they don't have any in-house historians um, and what we've been trying to do I think is to off, you know, adapt ourselves to offer, offer so, try to offer some insights into development history uh, for uh, ex-DFID colleagues if I can put it that way. Um, it's quite difficult because we're not experts ourselves but interesting enough two former permanent secretaries of DFID have written histories of international development. Uh, one actually wrote on the history of the Purgao Dam, one of the less fortunate episodes. Um, and uh, we ourselves have done some work on this in that one of our retired colleagues, Keith Hamilton, wrote a history of the know-how fund, which was the development fund for Eastern Europe in the 1990s. And we, we, you know, we, we, did a, we did a whole seminar on that. 
So I think we're trying to make an offer to, to ex-DFID colleagues, and we are getting some interest, I think. Um, one of our other colleagues has written two long blogs on the history of overseas development uh, since the 60s. Um, we're not there yet. It'll take quite a while, I think, but I think the, the beginnings of interest are there. That's great. Thank you. Um, I, I can see there's a question in the chat from Neil about, um, he said, hi, and thank you for this talk. Do you have any recommendations for how more historically minded colleagues without access to an in-house historical team could better integrate history into policymaking? I'm going to pass the buck on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Jill, <laughs> Richard. We do have... Um... We do have, uh, we are part of what's known as the Whitehall History Network. And whilst we are probably one of the only departments with uh, in house historians, um, you know, doing history, although the service branches have their own historical branches, there are, there is a lot of interest across government, you know, the Whitehall departments um, relating to, you know, his history. So the Treasury, for example, don't have historians, but they do have people who have a Treasury History Network and they get academics in from outside, you know, through organizations like History and Policy, for example, um, uh, you know, and different parts of the Treasury partner um, with different academics to give talks on, you know, whatever it is that, uh, whatever it is that policy officials want to know about. Um, so, and there's a growing interest, I think, there are a lot of different departments, about for transport, you know, departments that you might not think are particularly historically minded. Um, there are people um, in other departments who are interested. And so the, the Whitehall History Network really is a way in which we can share expertise and uh, best practice amongst government departments and all keep in touch with what we're doing and you know, uh, pass on information and things like that. So um, you know, other government departments can access history um, and academics, even though uh, they don't have their own you know, in-house team like the FCDO does. That's great, thank you. Um, Sarah Dorman asked, he, uh, she said, could you talk a bit about your relationship with the RA cadre, many of whom are historians, as I discovered to my surprise when I was seconded to Africa directorate. I'd always assumed they were more political science oriented. In fact, much of what much of the work that they did was, um, was, was deeply historical. Um, yes, uh, yes, we, the answer is we work very closely with them and, and it's absolutely right that many of them are historically trained. Um, they have a different function from us in that they are very closely uh, linked to, to, to death. They literally sit with the, po with the policy desks, uh, uh, usually on a geographical basis, but there's also thematic ones like international organisations. Um, and they are slightly different from us in that there is more interchange between the research analyst and the regular diplomatic service than we have. Some of them um, go and serve overseas for some years. Some of them have served as ambassadors, for instance. Um, but in, on a daily basis, we work together quite a lot. We often have to, to share uh, qu questions come in. I had one today about um, uh, Jordan, for instance. It's 100 years this year since Jordan um, uh, became independent. And um, I don't know much about the history of Jordan, but I know research analysts who do. So I pass the question on to them. So that's just one small example. That's great. Thank you. If I could just, should I just add to that? I think, I mean, as, as Patrick said, the research analysts tend to be uh, country specific or region specific, apart from the teams like multilateral and so on. Um, and there's no, I mean, people have asked before, is there a kind of cut off? What, where do you start being historical? I mean, there isn't a, a definite, we do work closely, but for the very recent things, we, in, that they tend to deal with that rather than we do it. And if it's a bit older, it, it might tend to come to us. But the other difference is that the historians really have to take whatever thrown at us. It can be any region of the world, any period in history, anything. I mean, we might not know, but it's, it's absolutely serendipity where um, uh, the research analysts are, are more focused on a particular area. That's great, thank you. Um, yes, another question here. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the name of the uh, of the individual, but it's um, outside the document series. Approximately, what percentage of your time is devoted to publishing historical work in academic journals and other scholarly venues? <laughs> I think not as much as we would like. Uh, I think it's quite difficult actually um, to maintain an, an, an independent academic career. I mean, I know this 
myself because I, you know, I was an academic, a sort of mainstream academic, and until uh, until I moved across here in my early fifties, and I've I've kept I've kept a hand in, as it were, but I haven't done major work. Uh, there simply isn't isn't the time. You have to do it in your spare time. If you're very lucky, your research interests will coincide uh, with your uh, uh, foreign office related um, duties, but it doesn't happen very often. We all publish a bit. Um, Jill, uh, Jill, since retiring, has published a great deal. But I think it would be true, Jill, that it was hard to get much done until you retired. Yes, it, it was. And um, even though retirement seemed a bit notional in 2020, I have to say. Yeah. But yes, um, uh, it, it obviously is. But then it, it, I've definitely found it helpful, of course, because the thing about working as an in-house historian within within well, any department is that you actually get to know a lot more how things work and what goes on and that does help you in writing our own work but we don't uh, Patrick's quite right we don't do a, bit, a lot of kind of uh, submitting articles to scholarly journals and so on but of course as a as a team we do put out apart from the volumes we mm -hmm. do publish quite a lot um, online history notes which can be or on all sorts of things. Um, and also last year, we also had a new, we christened a new series of publications. Actually, Richard, why don't you talk about those? Because that was another new initiative, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, it's called Documents on, um, uh, Documents from the British Archives. And where it might take several years, yes, Patrick's holding one up there, where it might take several years to produce a volume, a DBPO volume. This was a way of making um, you know, information available more quickly and more cheaply. So we took a tentative step into online publishing with Amazon. Um, so we publish hard, these, these books, hard copy on Amazon for not very much money, basically at a cost. So they're you know, cheaply available for students. And we also put it on our website because we retain the copyright and there's no problem with that. We put it on our website for free so people can download it from wherever they are in the world. And the first one we did was on the Potsdam conference because last year it was the, um, what would it have been 75th anniversary of Potsdam? Um, and what we did is we took documents from across eight different DVPO volumes and compiled them into, into one volume. And we added some intelligence material, which wasn't available at the time that the original uh, DVPO volumes were, were published. Um, and, and then we published that, uh, you know, partially to, to, to mark the anniversary. And we've subsequently done another one on um, preparatory talks for the CSCE for the Helsinki conference. Um, and we're doing another one at the moment um, for this August for the uh, Berlin crisis in 1961. So it's a way in which we can either uh, supplement what's already in DBPO volumes or you know, extract material from multiple volumes and package it in a, in, a, in a different way, more cheaply and accessibly for, for people. And that was something which we could do during lockdown when we didn't have any access to the, to, to the archives and, you know, limited access to the FCO and TNA archives. Thank you. And I can say that all of your work is heavily cited by, by scholars in the, um, um, in, 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 in the academy and there's um, just such a wealth of material that you you put out both in primary sources and, and in terms of your, your own material which is just which is just excellent um alex mcdougall has a question about um, has the work you have done on china increased in recent years if it has what themes have you organized your research around and have you found anything particularly interesting uh i'll i'll answer that quickly and probably hand over um by by coincidence we are actually working on a volume of documents in our dbpo series on British UK relations with China from the late 60s to the early early 70s around the time of the Cultural Revolution but that wasn't specifically related I think to any any recent developments it's been running it's been a volume it's been in production for some years um Jill or Richard might want to say more I don't think there's a huge amount of extra uh, work we've done in relation to China recently but they may want to add more no, I mean that document series is uh, that, that volume is is our main uh, you know activity relating to China. China does have a huge does have a large research analyst cadre, so um, you know there are lots of uh, there's lots of expertise, historical expertise relating to China. Uh, you know, over and above anything that we might be able to bring. 
we have done, uh, there are some Historypedia entries uh, that, um, uh, that on things like, for example, the Boxer Rebellion. Um, and it has come up, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, in, to do disinformation and so on. There's been a certain amount of work on that. So I think it's also likely that we'll be doing more on China in the future, but um, working closely with the research analysts because they have a, a big expertise on this. I have a couple of quick questions about um, about archives. Um, first, from Sean Kershaw, how 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 do you think um, do you think there are going to be significant challenges posed to historians and the documentary record by the modern means of communication? And do you have any plans for how you might combat the issue? And from Rasmus um, uh, Bertelsen, many developing countries may lack archival resources and today academic history resources. Um, how may that limit their foreign policy today? How can the UK and other Western states provide support? Uh, very, very quickly on the first one. I mean, I think, yeah, it's going to be a, ma a it is going to be a major challenge to construct historical uh, narratives on the basis of the records that exist or do not exist um, in the digital era, um, which I think really is probably from the mid mid 90s onwards. I'm not pessimistic, as pessimistic as some people are about this. I mean, I think the formal record keeping, it has almost come to an end actually in, in, in most government departments everywhere, I think. Um, there's just huge masses of emails and so on that, that pile up, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's an intractable mass of material or that it cannot be organized and searched in some ways, perhaps ways that we don't even know about yet. And I think that um, if you look on, at the work the National Archives are doing on the transfer of digital records from government departments, including the FCDO, um, the, what they're doing is quite remarkable. And they're also developing ways of, of digitally sensitivity reviewing digital documents in, as opposed to uh, having to read paper documents. All these things I think are doable. Um, and I think um, I did try a, short, a small experiment a few years ago. Could I construct a narrative of a particular event on the basis of only digital records? And I dug out a few relating to a, a summit conference. I can't remember it was in the, in the early 2000s. And uh, I, I concluded in the end that I could. My problem was I didn't know whether I'd found all the material or not. If it had been a paper file, I could be pretty sure where it ended. But with a digital search, I, I could have used different search terms and it might have come up throughout quite different answers. But I think in, in principle, people are, gonna, are going to solve those sorts of problems. Um, it'll be different from what we do now, but it won't necessarily be worse, I think. On the other question about countries which haven't got very good archives, um, I just drag, dredging my memory here, but there are people who work with developing countries on, on maintaining and improving our archival resources. We don't do that, and I don't know the detail myself, but, but such people exist. Um, that's as far as I get for now, I'm afraid. I don't know where my what, colleagues what you do do is work um, with um, other countries who are producing, not necessarily the same um, kind of volumes as us, but the, the International Conference of um, Editors of Diplomatic Documents. I mean, there are more and more countries now getting involved with this. Um, network, aren't there? I mean, when we first started it all those years ago, it was like, you know, four or five countries who did it. Now, how many there are there now, Richard? There must be about 20, I think. And that's a good way of sharing expertise on, on, on archival use. And you and Cast has got a, a question about how mindful of history do you think the recent integrated review is or should be, and I know you mentioned the integrated review at the beginning of, of your remarks, um, and you and uh, classical realist, for instance, would argue that history is deeply important for the development and implementation of contemporary foreign policies. Is this your understanding of the UK's overall approach? Many thanks for such an insightful and interesting introduction to this series. Well, my quick answer to that is, well, John Bew wrote the integrated <laughs> review, or, or some or words along that, those lines. Um, I think it's more historically informed than any that I know of. Um, I haven't read it in detail, Jill has. And Jill has actually had some input into the sort of things you've been doing at King's actually over the last months also. Uh, so again, she could say more about this. Um, in fact, I think I better stop and let, let someone else take over, Jill. Well, only in the sense that I was involved with the, um, the, 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 set, the, the papers on strategic reset, which Andrew and, and you were all organizing uh, last year. So my particular contribution was on whether there was a strategic reset after Suez 
and I argued that there wasn't. And there was a series of, of, of essays, which I gather now are going to be published, um, all looking at strategic resets of various sorts, and that all fed in to the integrative review. I mean, it, you know, these kind of documents, the integrative review, are obviously having to serve a great many different purposes. Um, I haven't quite finished looking through it all, but I, I have looked quite a lot of it, and I, I was, I have actually been impressed at the the level of the, that it is rooted in history. Obviously, it, 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 not, it wouldn't be right for it to be citing a lot of historical examples, but um, all I can say is you can see John Bew's hand at work, I think, which is, as far as we're concerned, a very good thing. That's great, thank you. Um, Hugo Minter asks, he says, thank you very much for the interesting discussion. I was wondering whether the panel has considered the work of Richard Neustadt and Ernest May, Thinking in Time, um, from the mid 80s and if so do they think the conclusions of the authors could be feasible today in using history within policy making i can certainly yeah. say for the um for the, for the nature of, of of the whole endeavor that we're engaged in that book is very much a, a founding text and and very influential but i'd love to hear um uh, yeah. the panelists views on it well i could do that one if you like because <laughs> that book was directly responsible for the book that i wrote um which was published in 2013 which was called six moments of crisis inside British foreign policy. And I, I use the techniques and, and the process that Neustadt and May used. Uh, I was only looking at foreign policy, whereas they look at domestic um, questions as well. But absolutely, um, it is a, a, a seminal text. And, and I, I like to think that, um, that I brought it a bit more into the modern age and indeed, um, I have, you know, it was published in 2013. I know that it has been used quite widely in the office, which is very pleasing. And, and great to have that. I mean, obviously, the main news that was very much focused with sort of an American um, yeah, policy world. Right. So to have that brought into it's a different focus. That yeah. Our system works quite differently. Yeah. So an extremely important text. And um, yeah, so that that's that, it's, it's, a, it's a great work. Um, can I um, go to Martin now, who um, um, was asking about about your scope, problems, rewards, experience, etc. in working with the press? Mm. Um, we don't work very closely with the press. I mean, one reason is the foreign, foreign uh, FCDO has a press office or media, media office, which deals directly with the press. Um, and although we have, we do have contacts with journalists and they come to some of our events, um, I would think it's a sort of, um, it's a relatively distant relationship. I don't know whether Jill or Richard would... Well, it used to be a lot closer mm. um, at one time, I would say, perhaps in the 90s, but... I think, um, uh, you know, there was a discipline in, uh, which was imposed upon Whitehall um, with, with, the, with the, the, the Labour government that came in in 97 and, and the hand of Alistair Campbell. And I'm not complaining about that because it was actually, from my point of view as a historian, it was, it was positive because we were trying to get everybody to realise what everybody else was doing and that if somebody made a, an announcement, it wasn't directly crossing over what somebody else was doing. But part of all that was a much more um, streamlined press um, operation. Now, obviously, sometimes um, we do work with, as Patrick said, we do work with journalists. Uh, sometimes press office um, consult us about things. But on the whole, um, they have probably take, um, they, they don't tend to consult as much as they used to. I'm not, you know, it works the other way. We don't always tell them what we're doing either. <laughs> I'm going to collect um, a few questions now because um, we've got quite a few in the um, in, in the Q and A, and I wanted to get to get to all of them if, if possible. Um, firstly, from Martin Browns, um, saying, "Sadly, as a historian, I increasingly identify a creeping dislocation in public discourse between complex historical truths and simplistic historical myths, with stubborn myths sometimes proving more influential than the facts. How difficult or easy is it to cure policymakers from certain myths that they might hold dear?" And then we have um, uh, a couple of other questions in relation to archives. Uh, one um, uh, from an anonymous attendee saying, thank you for an interesting talk. As an outsider, I would be grateful for any comments you may have on historical papers and the criteria for their release under the 30 year rule and who may delay their re release and what the re reasons may be to delay it. 
Also, you're able to access these and other restricted or classified papers for any submissions you may make in an advisory capacity. And then finally from Ramsey, how much of your time is usually spent at the National Archives? Have you been limited in the material you can access over the past year? Um, all, the, lots of interesting questions. Um, it's a, tr truth versus, versus myth is a difficult one. Um, uh, I think I'll, I'll dodge that one for a minute. I might come back to it. Uh, on the archives, our criteria for release and so on. Um, basically, the idea of, a lot of stuff is discarded because it's deemed ephemeral and not uh, and doesn't meet the criteria for, for preservation laid down by the National Archives. What remains is, is policy related stuff and a large proportion of that material comes from the Foreign Office than anywhere, anywhere else in government except the Cabinet Office. Um, and basically everything is released except things that are deemed unreleasable. And those things are mainly to do with um, national security or, or, or intelligence. And I, I think that, I think as an outsider, when I was an outsider, I didn't quite understand how these things work. But as an insider, I can see that the impetus is, is all for openness rather than being closed. The people involved, the retired diplomats who um, review the material have a series of very strict criteria which they apply and they try and their, their instinct is to open up as much as possible. Um, and what they close is, is closed usually for good reasons and there's always a re review period. And after some years, it's often quite clear that there's no point in holding the stuff back any longer. Stuff that was sensitive at one point is no longer sensitive um, and it can be released. Um, on whether we can use closed materials ourselves, yes, we can. We can have access to all the material in the National, in the Foreign Office archive before it goes to the National Archive. And we also have access to the National Archive. Um, we don't have the right to necessarily to publish it. Uh, anything we pub propose to publish has to be reviewed like everything else. Um, and there are things that we're not allowed to publish, which also mainly relate to uh, in intelligence. Our access to the National Archives has been very restricted like everyone else's in the last year. But when we've asked for help, they've been extraordinarily helpful. I think Jill in particular would, would agree with the, some of the stuff that they've got out for us and gone in in quite difficult circumstances and, and photo photographed uh, and so on. So I've dodged the question about uh, truth and, and truth and myths uh, in relation to policymakers, but I'll ask my colleagues perhaps to deal with that one. Well, can I talk about myths for a minute? <laughs> I mean, I would regard nearly all my career um, uh, uh, spending an awful lot of time in trying to um, correct myths, deflate myths, whatever you do with myths, and indeed conspiracy theories, which are another thing that, um, uh, though that tends to be something that not, not necessarily ministers um, hold conspiracy theories, but certainly people assume that there are big conspiracies within Whitehall, which is really not the case. Myths are very difficult because Ministers do uh, perpetuate certain things. Um, it, you know, I have to grip my teeth when I hear somebody saying it's another Suez, it's another Munich, it's another. And what we can do as historians within the office is to retell the story again and again with the facts, um, putting in the different aspects. And it's impossible to eliminate it because people get things in their heads and you get a new set of ministers coming in and they've got a new set of ideas. But at least um, when it happens, we are able to say, actually, this is, this is a myth. This is not the case. They may not accept it. You can't do anything about that, but you can certainly um, try not to make sure it's not perpetuated. And there are a lot of myths. Just on the, just to add to Patrick's point about uh, file transfer to the National Archives, it's important to note that <coughs> when um, when Foreign Office uh, documents um, are ready for transfer to the National Archives and their sensitivity reviewed before they go, and uh, you know some bits may be redacted and some files may be withheld, but the criteria for withholding or redacting are the same exemptions that apply in the Freedom of Information Act. So it's set down in legislation 
when you can and can't um, you know, redact something and you have to apply one of those exemptions in the Freedom of Information Act. So uh, the fact that it may be embarrassing to the government is not a factor for withholding information uh, that eventually finds its way to the National Archives. So um, it, is a, it, is, it does have a legislative framework. It's not just a kind of free fall. That's great, thank you. I'm gonna do two more rounds of questions. The first ones are, are two slightly longer ones. So I'll put those together and then um, three shorter ones afterwards. So the, the two longer questions are, um, first, thank you for the really interesting presentations. What perspective paths did you all take to become historians at the FCDO? It is, essential to be, is it essential to be an established academic to realistically seek a role as an FCDO historian, or do you also find recent graduates, early career historians applying for roles in the team? And the second question was about um, uh, looking at Winston Churchill in light of Black Lives Matter, the discussions surrounding statues, and recently the Churchill College Cambridge se seminar. Um, this person says that they think further discussion of his attitudes towards race and empire might be useful, particularly coming from the official historians. Thank you for your work on the murals. <laughs> I think there's some, some loaded questions there. I mean, the, the easy one to answer is our, our paths to the, to the Foreign Office. Um, first of all, not about me, but about one of our most recent appointments, quite a few years ago now, but it was a classic early career appointment. It was someone who got a PhD not long before and had a bit of experience in working with various um, uh, parts of um, the government uh, uh, parliamentary system, actually. Um, my own path was very, very late in very late in life. I was already an established professor in a, in a provincial university. I was getting so fed up with the way university was going. I saw an advert in the Guardian and I applied. That's my answer, Jill. <laughs> well, I, I started. Um, I came in as a research assistant, um, uh, very young, um, and and basically never left. But I did um, have a five year period in mid. Uh, career, if you like, when I did three other posts within the Foreign Office, not, not related to history. And that was an extremely um, useful experience. And then I was asked to go back as chief historian after that. So um, I have a, I am a lifer in terms of the Foreign Office and history. Um, uh, but and as you see, although I retired 15 years ago, I'm still here. I mean, my own. I'm not. I mean, I wasn't an academic. I obviously did a PhD, um, but then worked for an organisation called the Historical Manuscripts Commission, which joined with the Public Record Office to become the National Archives back in 2003. And at that point, I went to work for the Department for Culture, Media, and Sport as a you know regular civil servant, and then came to the Foreign Office from there. So I uh, kind of came back to do history from a, a kind of policy um, policy department. Um, so that's my pathway to uh, to the Foreign Office. On the on the Winston Churchill question, I mean, I, I, I don't know the answers to this one really. Um, uh, there was an article in the Guardian today or yesterday, I think, by um, the person who organised the um, the seminar at Churchill College and on Ch Churchill uh, and how much um, abuse they got for for having done it at all. And uh, the, I mean, I find Churchill extremely problematic because I think he's an absolutely wonderful admirable figure in so many ways but also ex an extremely flawed figure and I think that's how, how most people are that he just had both virtues and, and vices in, in on a larger scale than most other people I mean I spent a long time in my earlier career looking at his career um, at, at the Admiralty for instance and you know some of the decisions he made there were awful um, and disastrous um, it, it was largely Churchill who got us into the disaster in Norway in 1940 for instance but that doesn't uh, um, just detract from the fact that you know, we would have lost the war if he hadn't been prime minister. I think that's, that's, that's fairly clear. Um, and his uh, views on race are very, very well documented and they're, they're, they were pretty, pretty objectionable even by contemporary standards. Um, how we deal with that, I don't know. I'm, I'm afraid you know, the views on people like Churchill have become more polarized and it's, been it's now less easy to discuss them historically than, than it was um, some years ago, I think. And that's uh, a coarsening of the national debate, which has happened in many other many, many other spheres as well. I have no answer, I'm afraid. I think it's important to say, I mean, or to remember that we are civil servants at the end of the day and not academics. And so, you know, we don't have that kind of academic freedom, uh, you know, to, to, at the end of the day, to say whatever we like to, certainly not in a public forum. So... Um, well, I've just said it, haven't I? Well... <laughs> 
Thank you. Some, some great answers are very helpful on, on the background to your careers. Um, I'm just going to go to the last, these will be the last three questions. So sorry if, if, if people did have questions they didn't get a chance to answer, uh, to ask. Uh, firstly, from Van Gervais Sin, how important are historical an uh, analogies for historians advising on foreign policy issues? And do you think there is a danger of over-reliance on analogies that might be simplistic or obvious? Um, and then two final questions. One, from an anonymous attendee, do you have involvement with the training of diplomats before they go overseas? Was that more often done by the RAs, the, the research uh, assistants? Uh, um, and another one, uh, many commentators have likened the current pandemic to the Spanish flu and other such events. How useful are historical analogies when trying to explain the present? So, yeah, a uh, couple of questions dealing with analogies at the end. Well, I th they're very helpful questions. Thank you. I mean, the the, there are different kinds of analogies, I think, and, the, and the, the, the analogies that were raised by the first question are more like the ones that Jill was talking about, which are, which are myths. Um, and you, the anal the anal an analogy between a, a problem today and the Suez crisis or Munich is extremely unhelpful. An analogy between the current pandemic and the Spanish flu is extremely helpful because they're, 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 they're cognate a phenomena, if you, if you like. They're the same sorts of things which are producing the same sorts of responses. I think you can you can um, use historical examples of disease a lot more helpfully than you can use historical examples of foreign policy or military decisions. Um, my colleagues may want to say more on that subject. Involvement with training. Um, well, there is a general training program in the International Academy and we do contribute to that. When diplomats go overseas, um, it's usually the research analysts, uh, you're right, who make those, who, who pr provide the training. Very occasionally, I've, I've actually spoken to people about countries that I know about, mainly in Scandinavia and the Baltic, um, before they go on, on, on post, but that doesn't happen very often. Um, so it's a bit random. Again, if we have little bits of knowledge, we can, we can contribute. Other, my colleagues might want to say more. Usually the research analysts for, for pre-post training might get in outside academics who are experts in the economy of a particular region or, you know, know the uh, political, um, uh, you know, political setup in a particular country, you know, in great detail. So um, they do draw on academic, outside academic expertise for that kind of thing as well. In terms of analogies, you, we, we always are very careful, really. On the whole, if you're asked to provide advice um, to officials or indeed to go to ministers, um, you would not really want to be saying, you certainly would never say this is just like X because it never is. Um, but obviously, from our point of view, from the work, you can find in certain episodes aspects which may be helpful in formulating the kind of advice you give. Um, but really, this is kind of one of the reasons why we started the Historopedia function, because we found that, you know, officers, especially younger officers, would say, well, you know, I've heard of the Nazi Soviet pact or whatever. But I can't, I can't remember what it is. Now, yes, they can Google it, but what they need to know is why is this still relevant to us now? Why does it keep coming up again now? And there are certain things uh, like that which come up again and again. They may be very old, but they still come up again and again, even if they're not old, like, for example, the Helsinki Final Accords or a treaty or, or all sorts of things. Abel Archer is, is an example. Um, but it doesn't mean we're not saying this was just like X, but we are saying there are these aspects in a particular episode or um, treaty or whatever, which can, which are still relevant to your business and you ought to know about them. It's rather that's the way you would approach it. Thank you so much. Um... That was a it's a great way to finish um, this this session and um, some really really fascinating answers and to get an insight into the way in which some of these things inform policy has been has been really enlightening. So um, you, um, obviously, I'm sad I have to call this to an end because I know there'll be um, a lot of other people wanting to ask questions and um, I think the 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 quality of the, of the questions and the um, is, is a testament also to the quality of the the presentations and just what what a fascinating discussion that we've we've had here today. And so, yes, before we before we finish off, I just wanted to thank um, all three of you for a really excellent, stimulating,
presentations and discussion and really the ideal way to kick off this uh, this series of events. Um, and to everyone else, um, thank you for, for coming. Thank you for your participation. And please keep an eye out for future events. We're going to be running a whole series of these. And um, yeah, th this this is um, if, if, yeah, if, if, if if others follow on in the, in, in the in the footsteps of what we, we've done today, then uh, I think this is going to be a very exciting series. So thank you so much to all three of you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank, Thank you very much. Pleasure. Bye.